Stan Bell, I'm the Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation. Um, we are here today because there's an election on, um, uh, but also to mark the end of a trilogy for us. Um, this is the kind of Return of the Jedi element of the three-part election publications we've been setting out. First of all, covering the size of the overall state on offer, in brackets, huge or about the same as now. Uh, last week, covering tax in pretty similar big rises or about the same as now. Um, and today we're going to cover social security, which hopefully is going to be the happy ending of the trilogy. Rob, who just wandered out, claims trilogy is a happy ending. I'm not sure that's always true, but anyway. The, um, this one is kind of take your pick. So that's what we're going to do. We published that report on our website today. It's very long. You're going to read all of it, obviously. Um, but to kick us off, it's author Laura Gardner, our research director here, is going to give you a presentation of the summaries, talking not just about what's on the table in this election campaign, because that is not the only test, looking instead at the bigger picture history of Social Security and then saying, what are the underpinning trends happening in Britain today that ideally, obviously this isn't happening, but ideally you would be focusing your Social Security reforms as being answers to the question the country is actually asking. The, um, uh, and then to kick off a discussion, we're going to hear from Nancy Kelly, who's the Deputy Chief Executive of NatSen and has done lots of other things over the years in this space. But particularly, if honest, NatSen is the only organisation really producing detailed work on what the public think about Social Security and politicians coming up with policy proposals about that should be paying a lot of attention to the work they are doing. And then we're going to hear from Nick Timmins, who is a public policy expert and has, again, done many things, but is the author of The Five Giants, A Biography of the Welfare State, which is second edition of came out third, third edition third. also a trilogy third final <laughs> final okay fine all right so, who knows <laughs> don't, don't rule out life nick. anyway right and then we're gonna hear from nick and then we'll hear from uh, you guys afterwards so over to you laura to kick us off right so i'm not a star wars fan so i don't know if being the return of the jedi is a good thing um i'm quite into the his dark materials uh, series on the BBC at the moment though, so it's definitely as good as the Amber Spyglass and almost as long. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, as Torsten mentioned, this report's the third in a trilogy, looking at um, the shape of the state going into this election. The previous two looked at overall government spending and the shape of the tax system. <coughs> Unlike my colleagues who wrote those, I've had the distinct advantage of actually having manifestos to base my analysis on. Uh, rather than having to rely on what turned out to be quite well-educated guesses. And as Torsten said, across these reports, our goal isn't just to tell you what the parties are proposing, but to set those proposals in the long-term context of what's changed and the big social and economic trends that policy should be responding to. Um, so with that in mind, this presentation is going to attempt to answer three questions. They're shown here. Uh, to move on to the first of those, um, how have we got to the social security system we have today? So... Uh, start with the longest time series I could build, showing a kind of 150 years of the social security system. That's the benefits and tax credits uh, administered, to, administered by the Department for Work and Pensions and HMRC. They total around 225 billion today. That's around 10% of GDP. Uh, as you can see from this chart, this spending's fluctuated over time, but in general grown as a share of the economy. So it was about 4% of GDP back after the Second World War. It's three times that now. And it's going to rise to about, uh, on the OBR's projections, about 12% of GDP um, in 50 years' time. And that's largely driven by uh, the effects of an ageing population. Um, so if that's the overall size of the state over time, then what uh, size of the social security system over time, then what benefits is it made up of? Well, that's shown on this uh, rather busy slide. Um, which splits benefit and tax credit spending into some different major categories over the past four decades. Um, there's quite a lot going on, so I'll just draw your attention to a couple of things. Um, first, we can see on the left-hand side of the chart fluctuations in state pension spending, which obviously makes up a very sh large share of overall spending in every period. Um, some of these fluctuations relate to demographic changes, which I'll come back to, uh, but they also relate to, for example, the decision to uprate the state pension um, at a slower rate than the fast earnings growth in the late 1980s, which drove down the share of overall welfare spending that was state pension spending. Um, second, I think the really big shift in other benefits over this period has been the decline in emphasis on income-related out-of-work benefits. And the, the ones I'm talking about are um, incapacity benefits, uh, which are shown on the sort of uh, 
dull purple bits, uh, the spending on uh, income support for single parents next to them, and spending on unemployment benefits in the red next to them. Um, in the late 80s, that was a quarter of overall welfare spending. It's now 9%. Um, and in its place have risen spending on uh, benefits that support the cost of disability in the purple bars, tax credits in the light blue, and housing benefit in the pink. Now, those changes partly reflect reclassifications. So, for example, we used to meet uh, the costs of children in our main unemployment benefit. That's now moved into child tax credit. Uh, but it also reflects economic trends and policy decisions. So to think about those trends and policy decisions in a bit more detail, I think it's helpful to summarise changes to the social security system over time as deriving from three factors. And unusually uh, for the Resolution Foundation, I've decided to represent those three factors using some pretty pictures uh, rather than complicated charts. But that's OK, because I've got a really, really complicated chart for you later. Um, so I thought you'd, I'd let you off at this point. So um, first, the economy. Uh, fairly obviously, social security spending is counter-cyclical. Um, it rises in economic downturns. There's basically three things that drive that. Rising caseloads, particularly for those income-related out-of-work benefits I was talking about. Rising awards, so for example, housing benefit will go up, all else equal, if earnings fall. And discretionary decisions to increase welfare in downturns. So for example, after the last recession, uh, the government decided to increase awards uh, for children in child tax credit. Um, my second big driver is demography. At its root, this is because we rely on the social security system uh, a lot more in some stages of life than others. Uh, so per, on average, per person, social security spending is seven times higher on pensioners than it is on working age adults. So as a result, uh, if the share of the population that's in pension age goes up, all else equals social security spending will rise too. And that's what drives uh, the OBR's forecast that I showed you on the first slide. My final point, represented by a smiling George Osborne, who, as we'll come back to, has a big role to play in the history of the last decade in terms of social security. Um, Self-evidently, policy decisions really matter. And I'd just point out that that's not just in terms of social security policy itself. There's also really clear spillover effects from other policy areas. So, for example, um, housing. So a really important point in terms of the last decade is that the latter two of those three, three factors I've been talking about have combined and reinforced one another. So an ageing population, as the large baby boomer generation moves into retirement, has been putting upward pressure on overall welfare spending. Um, but, but, but the decision to largely spare pensioners from large social security reductions over the past decade has doubled down on that fact and meant, as this chart shows, that the gap between per-person pensioner and non-pensioner spending is the <coughs> largest it's been in three decades. Meanwhile, those large um, cuts, <coughs> which have mainly borne down on the working age population, um, have had a really, really big impact, particularly on the poorest. So our estimate is that um, in the mid-2020s, the policy changes that have happened since 2010 have taken 34 billion out of um, social security spending. This chart shows how that um, splits out across the income distribution with really big reductions um, for the poorest, and that's all relative to the 2010 policy system. Um, so that's kind of a run-through of the long and short history of... Uh, the size and makeup of social security spending. The report goes into a lot more detail on um, some of the conceptual or procedural frameworks that have also changed. So uh, a move away from contributory benefits, the rising role of activation policy and welfare to work programmes, and the enormous undertaking that is universal credit sitting behind lots of this. Um, I won't go into that in detail in view of time, so I'm going to move on to my second big question, which is um, what are the big social, economic and cultural trends that Social Security should be responding to and that parties should be thinking about? I've got five, which I'll go through very quickly. Uh, the first is health. So we know that the population is ageing and that has a large bearing on Social Security spending, but so do too does the health of the population at different ages. Um, and we'd draw your attention to a large rise in disability and particularly mental health problems among the working age population. So this chart shows the proportion of the population reporting uh, depression or mental illness as their main health problem. 
Uh, for under 60 year old adults, there's been a rise of three fifths since just 2013. And the rise has been particularly rapid as this chart shows for the under 35s. That has big implications for spending on disability benefits and how we design employment support designed to get people into work or help them progress. The second uh, big trend is not the one you might have been told. So when universal credit was invented, there was a really big emphasis on the motivation of tackling household worklessness. I'd argue that that motivation was out of step with the realities at the time and is even more so now. So this chart shows rates of household worklessness around, among working age households. Even when universal credit was first being thought through, uh, just after the crisis, household worklessness was lower than it was in the late 90s. And it's fallen by almost a th further third due to the employment boom of recent years. Instead, I think the big labour market challenges today are progression, insecurity and atypical work with 1.6 million people in agency work or on zero hours contracts, and also the increasing importance of dual learning within coupled households for avoiding rising um, in work poverty. Third big trend is housing. I've already mentioned this. This chart just really simply shows the big tenure shifts we've had over the past three decades or so. Uh, there's been a rising renting overall, and in, within that, a really big rise in more expensive private renting. Our main point here is that housing has been a really big, um, has put a lot of pressure on the social security system, and we expect this to continue to matter. So we've looked at whether younger cohorts will ever catch up with the home ownership rates of their predecessors. We think there's a good chance they won't, and that that, for example, will put a lot of pressure on the future housing benefit bill for pensioners. Um, fourth point is wealth really matters. This chart shows on the red line that assets have grown in relation to the size of the economy a lot over the past three decades. They were about two and a half or three times the size of the economy in the 80s. They're now uh, seven times-ish. Um, that means assets outgrowing incomes means wealth is incre increasingly important to living standards. And this is something that the social security system should at least be recognising. So we had a go at asset, based, at asset based welfare with the Child Trust Fund in the 2000s. We should be thinking about how our social security system can support asset building in the future. And my final uh, big trend, which hopefully tees up what Nancy's going to talk about, is the attitudes of the population matter. And here we see a shifting in attitudes towards more social security spending to support the poor, even if that means taxes rising, uh, with agreement with that question, the highest in 14 years. And my key point here is that if the public is more in support of benefits to help the poor than it has been in a while, then politicians responding to that, to that need to take account of who is poor today. So really strong pensioner income growth means that pensioner poverty has fallen by over a third in this century, while child poverty remains near record highs. And as a result, after housing costs, children are almost twice as likely to be in relative poverty as pensioners are. So if, if as a politician you want to look at this attitudinal data and respond to it, you need to really take account of who is poor. And that takes me nicely into my final section, which is what's going on in this election. So here comes my really complicated chart. As I've already mentioned, a decade of cuts to social security forms the backdrop to what the parties are proposing. So I'd, I've had a go at summarising both that entire decade and what all the, the, the three main parties are proposing in one chart. So here, to start off with, I've depicted what happened in the coalition government period, 2010 to 2015. Um, we had roughly 19 billion taken out of cash benefits. Um, offset slightly by a small amount of spending on infant school meals and uh, free childcare hours. So uh, in this chart, unlike in some of the previous charts, I am going to include um, certain in-kind benefits um, that, di that directly support families. So that's, that's where we got to by 2015. Then we had the uh, 2015 summer budget after that election, which proposed 14 billion of social security cuts. That's what's shown here, and it's split out um, into some different segments because some of those changes, the two-child limit, the removal of the family element, and reductions in support for the work-related activity group in ESA, um, take time to roll out because they're only for new claims or new children born after 2017. So it actually takes uh, a decade and a half for all those policies to take effect. Um, uh, roughly a quarter of those cuts uh, haven't been 
uh, rolled out yet. They're still to come. And a significant chunk won't even have been rolled out by the end of the forecast period in 2024. So that's what's shown there. So we take the 2024 position as our baseline. Since that summer budget, the Conservative government has basically rode back a bit on some of those cuts, investing in universal credit for working families via the taper rate and work allowances. That totals about three billion. And then we come to the offers on the table in this election. So uh, you, you might have to squint, but that's what we've got from the Conservatives on Social Security. That's a small amount of money on easing personal independence, reassessments and uh, childcare for school aged children. Um, here's some much bigger bars. Um, Labour is proposing nine billion of cash social security spending, around eight billion of in-kind spending on free broadband, TV licences, childcare and school meals. And I've also added on the post manifesto announcement to um, compensate women affected by fast state pension age uprating in previous periods. And the Lib Dems looks quite similar to Labour in overall spending terms, also nine billion cash, eight billion in kind. Um, so that's my really complicated chart. Hopefully you stayed with me. Now let's just look briefly at each of the three parties in a bit more detail. Um, so coming to the Conservatives, this is a, a little bit tongue in cheek, but uh, the plan on Social Security in their manifesto is to stick with the status quo. So I haven't been able to draw you a distributional chart. Um, uh, so what this means is that the, their plan is to continue to roll out the 3.8 billion of the 2015 cuts that are still to come. However, I would say it is significant that they're not proposing any further benefit cuts. Overall public spending will be rising and their manifesto does acknowledge the importance of tackling child poverty. So that, although they're not proposing big increases in social security, that does reflect the shifting political mood music. Here, oh, I've gone a bit faster. Um, here we see uh, Labour's package of cash and in-kind cuts that are costed in their manifesto across the income distribution. It's uh, very progressive overall, with very big gains to the lowest income families. Um, and within the manifesto, there is also a welcome focus on spending money on disability and housing, as well as more disability employment advisors and more social homes. And that does acknowledge some of the challenges I laid out in the previous section, so that's really welcome. <laughs> I would say that despite this picture, uh, some people will feel, still find themselves worse off under Labour than compared to the pre-2015 benefit system. And that's because while they're focusing on, on private renters, um, disabled people and large families via some of their reforms, um, they're leaving the effects of the benefit freeze in place. So, for example, working single parents will still be on average £600 per year worse off under Labour than compared to the pre-2015 system. And finally, it's not shown on this chart because these things aren't costed in the manifesto, but Labour's decisions actually in the long term reinforce the trend towards rising spending on pensioners. So the compensation for female state pension age rises, plus the decision to halt further increases in the state pension age, mean in the long run uh, that spending on pensioners actually dwarves their planned spending on working age families. Uh, this chart doesn't look very different, uh, and that's because both in the overall volume of spending terms and in some of the specific policies proposed, scrapping the two-child limit, the benefit cap, the bedroom tax, um, uh, childcare and school meals, uh, the Lib Dem package is quite similar to Labour's. Uh, however, I would point out it's slightly more progressive. Um, there's a, almost a gain of almost a quarter at the bottom of the income distribution here. It's uh, avoided the temptation to uh, spend more money on pensioners and it includes welcome investments in universal credit for second earners and self-employed people that the Resolution Foundation has previously recommended. Um, so final chart from me uh, looks at what these three policy packages are set to do to child poverty. Um, our forecast, uh, which is based on some work we did earlier this year in our Living Standards Outlook, is that child poverty will rise over the coming parliament to a record high. Um, that reflects the Conservative position um, on, a, on a kind of assessment just of the social security impacts. Um, so we've got, the conserv we've got child poverty at maybe 34% under the Conservatives at the end of the parliament. Both Labour and the Lib Dems uh, have social security packages that seem to be sufficient to halt this increase in child poverty. Uh, so the difference is at least 500,000 children between the Conservatives and those two parties. But these decisions aren't sufficient to see child poverty falling. 
And I would emphasize that um, what I haven't shown here on all my distributional slides is the fact that all these parties have costed uh, their spending fully on the basis of rising taxation. So what's really clear is if you want child poverty falling, you've got to make tough choices about where you're going to get the taxes to pay for it. Um, so to wrap up, a few quick conclusions. Um, I think it is really significant that uh, we're not talking about benefit cuts from any of the main parties in this election, and that's actually really welcome. Uh, but the backdrop of a decade of cuts looms really large and is what we and others will be judging part the parties against. Um, I think there is still evidence that the two largest parties are unwilling to face up to some of the really uh, big challenges around pensioner spending and the ageing population and making the decision to actually reinforce demographics and recent policy decisions in driving spending towards pensioners. Um, and as my charts have hopefully made clear, there is a really big choice in this election on social security, as in other areas of spending, in the size of the state uh, on offer by the uh, Conservative government and the two opposition parties, and the size of taxes you want in order to pay for that. So that's all from me. I look forward to hearing from Nancy and Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. The, um just to emphasise that, the scale of the tax and spend choice in this election is absolutely enormous. And you can't have the good pretty slides you want there unless you're happy to sign up to the big tax rises you need to pay for it. And then you get to decide, yeah. do you want to keep all of George Osborne or do you want to reverse chunks of him? That is basically what is on offer. Now, Nancy, what's the public on about? What are we on about? Okay, that's good. So I'll apologise in advance. I have neither as many nor as complex graphs as Laura. But on the other hand, I uh, know my Return of the Jedi. So you can think of me as a sort of statistically literate Ewok, if that helps you at all. Okay, so... I'm going to show you three graphs um, and three time series graphs taken from the British Social Attitude Survey, uh, which is one of our flagship surveys at NatSEN. And I'm going to try and answer really two questions that I felt were kind of behind the fantastic report that Laura's written. One is, um, is there space, is there public support for some kind of fundamental new settlement for a beverage mark II? Um, and if there is some space, what kind of space is it? And I think that uh, two kind of uh, points to make before I show you my three less interesting graphs. One is that uh, kind of public opinion matters, right? But it doesn't matter in a really straightforward way. We don't generally have direct democracy, and although we're experimenting with it at the minute, obviously. Um, but it matters in terms of policy acceptability. It tells us what, what you might be able to get away with if you're a policymaker <laughs> and what may, might may, make people more or less likely to vote for you. The other is, is that um, public opinion is super inconsistent. So public attitudes don't form these nice, neat clusters. They, you know, people hold contradictory views commonly. And if you watch carefully, you're going to see a little bit of that as we go. So that's the kind of health warning. Hurrah, graph number one. Um, so this is tax more, spend more. And you can see it's a really long time series all the way back to the early 80s when BSA was founded. And we're basically asking people to choose between three options. So um, do you want to reduce taxes and spend less on health, education and social security? Do you want to keep them the same? That's the slightly grim turquoise line. Do you want to increase taxes and spend more on health, education and social security? Um, I think this is a more useful variable than the very useful one from also from BSA, thank you very much, that Laura showed you, because uh, it's not just talking about welfare, it's talking about a broader public spending sweep. And, well, what can we see? I think the most interesting thing to me always about this graph is how unpopular taxing less and spending less has always been. Super interesting, right, uh, given the position of the parties over the years, over those decades. There, there they are down at the bottom uh, never more than 10% has supported the idea of taxing less and spending less on public services and, and we're currently uh, really, really low support. The other thing to note is that we can see here what you might describe as a kind of tiring of the idea of austerity. So you, you've got this lovely clear uh, change, kind of post-financial crisis, you can see actually that turquoise line is going up. It's going, okay, we're feeling a little bit small C conservative, let's keep the settlement where it is. Uh, you announce spending cuts, we're still up there saying, OK, OK, you know, we've got to tighten the belt. Um, in the last few years, since 2014 and the extension of austerity, support for the idea um, of keeping things as they are in terms of tax and spend has dropped quite quickly. 
and support for taxing more and spending more has gone up again quite quickly. Um, big question here is spend on what though? So the answer has always since 1983 been the health service. Uh, so 56% of us say spend it on health. Uh, education typically comes second and comes second in our most re recent set of data, but it's way behind. It's like 22%. So social security has always kind of languished in terms of public spending priorities. And I guess it's important to say that because otherwise we kind of get, get kind of run away with the idea that we can spend loads of, loads of cash on welfare. Okay, here we go. This is a shorter time series. You can see it only get, goes back a few years to 2006. And really it's just up here to illustrate some changes in terms of how people are thinking about the idea of poverty. So um, public cares about poverty. Everybody cares about poverty. They're a bit worried. They're worried it's rising. They're worried it's going to continue to rise in the future. And Labour supporters tend to be more concerned than uh, conservative supporters, which is what you can see here. This is the idea that there's quite a lot um, of poverty in Britain today, split out by party support. They've also developed in recent years, and I would kind of commend, a whole, there's a whole chapter on this in our most recent BSA report, a much more expansive notion of poverty. So Labour supporters are more likely to agree uh, with the idea that poverty is about quote, going without the kind of things most people take for granted. So the idea that poverty is about more than just not being able to meet basic needs, but is about being able to have a kind of a decent standard of living, I guess, is one way of looking at it. And so that's been one of the kind of recent changes. So we're at a point now where about 36% of Labour supporters say that's poverty. If you can't afford the things that most people would take for granted, then you're in poverty. It's compared to about 20% 20, 20 of Conservative supporters. So we're worried, we're getting a bit more worried, perhaps we're getting a bit more expansive, but that does not mean a, a kind of straightforward translation into support for all kinds of welfare benefits and particularly for unemployment benefits. Um, this is where the contradictory thing calls, comes in. We're very concerned about poverty, we're concerned about it rising. Uh, we're not as concerned about what the kind of UC or JSA values are. So we're still slightly more likely to say we spend too much uh, money on unemployment benefit, that they're too generous uh, than we are to say that they're not generous enough. So it's it's kind of pretty narrow these days. So 39% of us say they're too generous. And I think it's only 35% saying not generous enough. But nonetheless, um, we're pretty sceptical about the idea of unemployment benefits in particular, which hopefully this graph, which is pretty complicated, um, not as complicated as Laura's, I'll, I'll walk us through it. So, it, you know, if there's a bit of space, there's a bit of space around tax and spend, please tax us more, spend more. There's a bit of space around poverty. You know, where is, who, who is it we are interested in? Who would we really support uh, spending on? So this is, again, nice, nice long time series. We're back to 99 here. This is spend more on different types of benefit claimants. Um, so the big story here is what's happening in terms of pensioners. Um, you can see that for a very long time, support for spending a lot on pensioners was uh, really high. Retired people, this is, the, this is the kind of turquoise bar. And then it's dropped pretty precipitously. And it's interesting. So I think if you think about these clusters as being about the deserving poor uh, at, at the top end there and the undeserving poor at the bottom, um, we obviously don't think pensioners are undeserving. But there's some evidence that the public thinks that the welfare settlement for pensioners is where it needs to be. So we, could, we shouldn't necessarily continue to invest in further spending on pensioners. Who are we really worried about? Well, you can see them right at the top. Those are carers for disabled people. And then right under them, you have disabled people and then working families. And I think one of the things that was really interesting to me about um, Laura's report is this idea of um, the big shift towards more conditional forms of welfare, right? You get support so that you can work. You get support if you are working. And working families are, are kind of uh, seen very differently by the public, not just by policymakers. Single parents were seeing a kind of a, a, a increase in support for the idea of spending more on single parents. Across BSA, you can see we think about children really differently than we think about adults. And there is a rise in support for the idea of spending more on unemployed people. So that's that kind of classic 
um, unemployment benefits, but it's a rise from a low base. So you look at this and you might say, well, there's definitely space around disability and around caring, right? That we're interested in tax and spend, we're interested in poverty, we're very worried and increasingly worried about the position of disabled people and the position of their carers. But a final note of caution, really, even when we're looking at the carers, the people that we've always been really worried about and really wanted to invest in more, invest more money in supporting, um, we do kind of differentiate between support so that you can work and support so you don't have to work, which I think is very interesting. So when we say to people, should carers be able to get generous welfare benefits so they can look after someone they care for who's very unwell? People say, yes, yes, they definitely should. And then when we say, should they get lots of support so they can work? People say, yes, yes, they definitely should. When we ask them to choose which of those two options is most important, there's a really significant majority for the idea of supporting carers to work. So 60 8% of the public say, if you make me choose, I'm going to say support carers, not so they can stay at home and look after the person in their family or in their friendship network, but so that somebody else can look after them while they go to work. So I think that kind of idea of the labour market and conditionality and welfare is pretty well baked in to public opinion. So some space, not a ton of space. We would most rather spend it on health than anything else by a massive margin. No real sign of a kind of fundamental retooling of the settlement, including about conditionality, but definitely some signs of a desire to spend less on people post-retirement age, or at least stay static in terms of our spending on people post-retirement age, and more on disabled people and their carers. And that's my three graphs. Thank you very much, Nancy. That was very clear and very informative, <laughs> especially, as you set yourself up as an Ewok, and no one knows what the hell they're saying any of the time. Right, Nick, let's have some long history. <laughs> long view, um, Right, I'll be quite brief, really. I'll do three things. One is uh, just go even further back and say what's actually happened to the welfare state over the last 70 years that's got us here. Um, like a couple of remarks about, am I, am I echoing? Let's call the mic. Right, okay. okay. Right. Um, about Laura's excellent report, which I think is very good and I agree with. Uh, just a couple of minor mentions of bits in manifestos that seem to me more remarkable or less remarkable. And then a final comment on some of what um, uh, 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 some of these trends of opinion. So if you go right back, you know, 70 years of the welfare state, what's actually changed? And this is incredibly broad brush, but basically about five things. I mean, on the state pension, we've essentially gone round in one enormous circle to get back to a basic state pension at a reasonable level, singles basic state pension for everybody, and that's been a long, long circular tour. Uh, of course, it's affected by demography, because there are a lot, 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 you know, the demography's changed, and there's a lot of lot, much larger, older population, but it's a big circle. Uh, we've seen the rise from almost nothing other than for industrial injuries in disability benefits, and that's been a long-run trend and loads of those, plenty of other, those, those figures. Um, there was a the big shift from subsidising bricks and mortar to subsidising people with housing benefit. And that has been a real problem. I mean, housing benefit, ever since it came in, has been the case of running up a down escalator. You keep making the thing meaner to try and control the bill and it keeps going up. And it keeps going up for something that's got nothing to do with social security. It's got to do everything to do with housing policy. But it's been a real problem, and it just continues to be a problem. Um, then, the other big, really big change, the change over the sort of very late 90s, very late 80s, 90s, 2000s, when parties of all colours came to the conclusion that rather than pay people money on condition they did not work, they would spend some of that money subsidising them to be in work. And I think in the, you know, the, the biggest of the sort of conceptual shifts around the welfare state, I think that's probably the biggest single one in 70 years. It was a huge change. And it's led us to tax credits and now on to UC and what have you. And most recently, much more recently, the rise in childcare, childcare expenditure, which has gone from almost nothing to, I think we have one of the highest levels in Europe now, and the parties are planning to expand it. And that's been a big, different change. And that's got to do with all sorts of things like demographics, you know, Feminism, rise of work, families, all that sort of stuff. Huge, big drivers. 
Um, so that's a very, very, very long view. Uh, the sort of shorter views, I, I mean, Laura's entirely right, is, you know, the contributory principle has been falling away, still just exists in uh, JSA and ESA, uh, but it's been massively shrunk. It's more or less disappeared in pensions. Uh, where in pensions you get the rise of universalism because it's going to be quite hard not to qualify for the basic state pension in future. Um, but the contributory principle has more or less disappeared in that. And for working age benefits, it's just been the rise of mean testing. You know, the rise and rise and rise of means testing. Um, so if that's the sort of very grand picture, let me just pick... I just thought I... I mean, there's an awful lot in... There's almost nothing in the Tory manifesto. <laughs> Uh, there's a hell of a lot in the Labour Manifesto and quite a lot, so I'm not going to try and go through those. I just thought I'd pick out three things. Uh, one is that all three parties are promising to retain the triple log. And everything that Laura said about the shift towards pensioner benefit against working age benefit, that just reinforces that. And if it turns out this election delivers a government that lasts for five years, we're stuck with that for five years, and it's eventually got to go. I mean, eventually, eventually. You know, there was some justification when it first came in because there was a need to get the basic state pension up to something like 20, 25% of average earnings. So it's a sort of just about survivable level of basic income. So there was some reason for the ratchet in the first place, but it can't go on because over time, it's just a ratchet. It means the people in the basic state pension do better than people in work because if they get earnings, if it's earnings and if prices are high, they get prices. And if it's neither of those, they get... 2.5%. So eventually that's got to go and it does continue the shift towards you know, spending more and more on, on, on the pension of population uh, when one of the great achievements of the last 30 years has been the huge decline in pension of poverty. So that's kind of all three parties. Um, of Labour's, again on pensions, they want to stick at 66 and not raise the state pension age further. And I just think that's a, not a good idea. Um, you need long-term planning for pensions. I mean, you, you know, changing this sort of thing is exactly how you get into the sort of waspy women problem. When you make a pension change, you set it out, and then you go and tweak it close to operation date, and everything goes wrong. Because, um, you know, to be fair to Peter Lilly, when he set out that rise to 65, he gave 15 years notice and said it was going to be six months a year for a decade. Uh, so what went wrong? Well, first of all, of course, the DWP, having got through the controversy of passing the legislation, forgot to tell anybody about it when you need to keep telling people this is going to happen. But much worse was when Osborne came along and truncated the timetable and raised it to 66. And, you know, there's, there is a big injustice in there and it's not very fair. Uh, what should you do about pension age? I've, I've, I've always thought the answer really ought to be. I've never quite understood why this has never happened. You should just have a standing commission that looks at life expectancy every two, three, four, five years, and adjusts future rises or falls in state pension age according to what the longevity data is telling you, and it makes those changes at least 15 years out, so people have time to adapt, so whether it's going up or just possibly might come down. But you sort of take it out of the politics of parties and that sort of stuff. Um, Labour wants to scrap UC. Uh, and it's interesting that the manifesto goes further than their document of a few weeks ago, where they're actually saying we are going to replace it with... You know, the document of a few weeks ago actually just involves some tweaks, quite significant tweaks, but tweaks to UC. Now they say they want to scrap it. Um, and I... That's a huge change. I mean, if you want to... There is, there is right now no going back. You know, all the, all the machinery that used to do new claims for JSA and ESA and housing money, what have you, has all been dismantled to be put into, into, into UC. It's kind of UC. And you can't really even, it's very difficult even to pause it now because it's in every office. And as people's circumstances change, they're being moved across to it. And if you, and there's a lot of talk about the managed migration of the people on tax credits. In fact, if you did nothing, eventually everybody would end up on universal credit in about three decades' time because circumstances would change and there'd be new claims. Uh, and if you're going to scrap it and replace it, that will be a upheaval in the social security system on a similar sort of scale to introducing UC in the first place. So that's a hell of a challenge, I think. I really do. And one final point, which I'd, hardly anyone has probably noticed, but the Lib Dems, in their manifesto, have a proposal that they want to separate... Uh, employment support from benefits administration. Now, I don't know what the detail behind that is, but that 
that sentence stopped me in my tracks. Because if you, you know, the, back in the 2000s, we created Job Centre Plus, which merged the employment offices with Benefits Administration. It was a 2.2 billion programme, which for once came in, or came on, it came in on time and on budget. And the academic research is crystal clear that it made a real difference. It increased the it increased employment rate significantly because you put the two together rather than keeping them separate. And the idea that you'd now split them again just seems to me not very sensible, unless there's some subtle argument behind it that I've not come across yet. My final point. Um, I love all these that end figures. I think they're absolutely great. Um, the, the, I mean, I'm not being facetious. They are, they're really, really interesting. The problem is, does the public do when it comes to elections what it says it believes in? Yeah. When yeah. and it doesn't, you know. And it's interesting <laughs> that, you know, both, both the, you know, from these figures, the the, the 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 willingness to spend more, either on benefits for the poor or on health and services, is at a big gap compared to the last 14 or 15 years. But I would point out that in the 80s and late 80s and early 90s, it was much bigger. 60% were in favour of more expenditure, but they still elected conservative governments that were interested in restraining these bills rather than increasing them. Um, and my final point is this, that, you know, not since the night, I think this is a really, really interesting election because with the exception of the Labour's manifesto in 1983, not since the 1970s has a political party gone to the country saying we actually want to change the size of the state for bigger. Everyone has been very cautious. Even, you know, even Blair's stuff was saying basically all the parties have offered the deal that says we're going to spend around about 40% of GDP on pu public expenditure, go up a bit in recessions, but it's going to be around about that, rather than saying we're going to spend 42 to 44% and properties and therefore more in recessions and that is the choice the electorate's being offered this time and it will be very interesting to see if it votes for it. Thank you. Thanks Nick. <laughs> right before let's just pause briefly on the so that's our analysis and discussion of what the parties actually say and where the public <laughs> is coming from right now. Let's just pause slightly on what will actually happen on the two main parties, the on Labour and the Dems and the Tories. So on Labour, as you say, the, the rhetoric on scrapped universal credit is up, mm -hmm. with a kind of nugget of a saying we will at some point actually have a replacement, mm -hmm. but not clear what a replacement is. The, um, so you've kind of kicked us off with a not believing that, I think. Is that, is that your take? Or... Think, well, it's going to be very hard. Go on. It's just is, hard. Is it going to happen or not? It's hard. Is, will it happen or not? Life's hard, Nick. Though, so is it going to happen? My my suspicion is it probably won't. I mean, they'll be they would introduce a load of changes to UC, I suspect, but it would probably still be recognisable as six benefits into one with some change. I think because yeah. I think because it, it, you know the question is you say you just scrap it and replace it. Well, would you go back to what we had before? And I don't think there'd be a lot of votes in that. I don't mean votes, I mean votes in government for that, you know. Uh, so what are you going to do instead? So what's the, you know, what is the alternative? And they, Labour hasn't said what the alternative is. And you could dream up all sorts of different alternatives, I suppose. Okay, let's not do that. Nancy, it's going to happen or not? Uh, no. <laughs> That's a short, for, for all the answers yeah. you've just given, mm -hmm. and also because of the enormous cost involved right so in a world in which there is a Labour government and they come in and they get a briefing uh, on what it would take to do that what it would actually look like much like disaggregating the job centre network mm. their view on that policy will look very different the next day whether they could make enough changes to universal credit to call it something else that's yeah, a different sure. thing so it's a you know it's a, sure. the digital service is a digital service you can change the rules behind the digital service quite a lot you can call it something else mm -hmm. all of those kinds of things yes but can you stop the thing and replace it with another thing not without spending a lot of money and you know just what just one sort of trivial point that i was in a job center the other day and uh Job centre staff turn over, and I was talking, I had a dozen work coaches in a room. Only three of them had worked on the old system. Mm -hmm. The other nine, if you, talk, if you talk to them about the problems with JSA, they didn't know what the hell you were talking about, because they'd never admitted <laughs> to JSA, you know. So the whole staff is 
use the audiences. So it's not just you've got to redesign a whole system, you've got to retrain a whole yep. bunch of people. Very large number of people. Yeah. So we're heading for better credit, but not an actual new system. That would be my guess, okay. yeah. I'm going to charge for that if they actually <laughs> call it that. Right. The, uh, right. the Conservatives. Okay, so Laura's tumbleweed, uh, tongue-in-cheeks chart is getting at... There's not lots in this manifesto, and to be fair, there's not lots in this manifesto or lots of other stuff as well, including <laughs> tax cuts. So it's not just Social Security that there's not loads in, it's just like not, it's just quite short and sharp. Uh, did you know that they will get Brexit done? The, um, so the, um, but let's just pause on what will actually happen. Okay, so like, why is there not anything in Social Security in this manifesto? So one reading is they don't want to spend any more on Social Security or to cut any more. A different reading is Actually, the Conservative Party doesn't, for the reasons we've been discussing on public attitudes, doesn't want to be the party of benefit cuts particularly anymore. They don't want to be massive giveaways either, particularly the unemployed, but they don't particularly want to be the party of cuts. But they're treading two things, which is they promise lots of tax cuts that they're now not going to deliver. Mm. And they're also committed to a current budget balance, of which there is basically zero headroom mm -hmm. left against, broadly. And so if they want to spend any more to make some of the George Osborne problems go away, mm. they'd have to actually be increasing taxes. And you do that after an election, not during the manifesto. So maybe they won't actually want to be a government watching child poverty go up like that. The mood, the public mood has changed. Um, it'll be a difficult environment anyway. Yeah, well, I, I, my guess is they will spend more, and they will spend more on UC, and they will spend more on children. Because partly for the reasons you said, partly because just the pressure is there. Uh, though it's deeply distressing that they've said they won't raise actually sure runs income tax or VAT. I mean, why why would you want to constrain yourself like that? You know, you don't know what's going to happen. And you've got this pledge you're not going to raise the three the three taxes that raise the most money. It's completely bananas. It distorts the tax system. You know, it's the sort of promise politicians should never make. Because I mean just to be fair, they always make it. They don't, so, don't, I mean, like, they yeah. don't always, always make Basically, it. Basically, every election since 1997, everyone's made it. They haven't always, I've written a they few have, of them. They, have, they haven't so, always yeah. said on all three. <laughs> no, it's like a ratchet up, but yeah. basically, they, no. basically they have. Anyway, and also, what is not raising it? Yeah, 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 yeah. No increase in the rates, you can threshold around. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like Jeffrey has famous, we will, we will not double VAT. Exactly. Raised it from, from, which would have taken it to 16%. He only really took it to 15%, so they didn't double VAT. <laughs> Laura, what do you reckon is going to happen at the Conservative government? Yeah, I think um, I, d I think the sort of attention on the two-child limit means if... I, th I think there will be more emphasis on UC. I think the attention on the two-child limit, which is obviously given both Labour and the Lib Dems have committed to scrapping it, ramped up in the campaign, um, which is of the child poverty forecasts I showed, definitely the, the biggest driver of the difference between the Conservatives and the other two parties, means that is getting towards the top of the list for me. I think... Um, it's the kind of thing MPs or future MPs are probably hearing about from their constituents. as pe and, and they're only hearing about it now because it's only children born since 2017 being affected by it. So the, the, as I tried to point out, the costs of the two-child limit are mainly still to come. So I think they'll think more about UC, uh, but I think they'll go for the child two-child limit, which is actually not UC-specific first. Mm. And it's not that expensive. No. Such a big spender. Still quite expensive. Yeah. Billions. At least at least two billion. Two billion. On the labour. Uh, well, well, three well, point. It takes proper money. The two child limit won't be fully implemented till twenty thirty five. Yeah, yeah. And by that point, it'll be three point eight yeah, million. So it, it is money. money. You can't go you no, know, short throwing term. your billions around. <laughs> short term. <laughs> on the two child limit was uh, a few years back. I haven't seen it tested since. 2015, the most popular benefit cut by miles, mm -hmm. because basically everyone says, I've constrained how many kids yep. I had because of finances, have you met my house? That kind of thing. And they say, why should people on benefits not be similarly constrained? What do you reckon? Laura, optimistic or pessimistic? Or? Well, so, I mean, this, this comes back to the point about whether or not uh, public attitudes is actually what drives policy, right? But my guess would be, if we asked again, that that would still be fairly popular in terms of a policy that people... Um, tend to be relatively um, judgmental of people on out-of-work benefits in particular and the idea that they should be able to have kind of six kids and just kind of rack up kind of more and more child benefit and more and more kind of uh, benefits is not... Uh, it, it doesn't seem to me very likely that the needle will have shifted massively on that. I think if I was the, if I were the Conservatives and I were elected, I would be 
uh, looking at disability and caring for disability because there is that's really gumming up okay. uh, not only people's uh, inboxes but that's gumming up the whole social care spend right so you can save there too okay let's well, let's just quickly briefly on that then on disability so your charts show support for disability spend and caring for disabled mm -hmm. people spend being at the top, yeah. Laura's charts show a kind of staggering sea change going on in the nature of disability. Mm -hmm. So overall, the disability, the welfare state is doing more to support people with mm -hmm. disabilities. But while that is happening, the nature of disability is shifting significantly as physically, a physically disabled large stock population, lots of which is following from 80s and 90s changes, shrinks as we fail to deal with it basically and people mm -hmm. die. And then a huge surge coming through of new kinds of disability to simplify largely in the mental health space, although not entirely is what's going on. Will, how will public attitudes to supporting that disability change when mental health disabilities becomes the dominant form of that that they see? So we've, we did some work uh, in the last BSA around attitudes to return to work after serious illness. And what was interesting about that is how supportive the public is of people who have um, serious mental health problems and the idea of them kind of deserving uh, very positive regimes and support from their employer to engage them in in the labour market, which suggests really that we're in quite a progressive place about our understanding of the impact and the reality of mental health, and that we don't really make that big distinction between mental health and physical health. Just to push back a little bit on the positivity, so I don't, that sounds like that testing was do you support lots of pressure on employers to help people go back to work? Sure. When it comes to, will you give people lots of money because they're unable to work, which for some dis physical disabilities, there used to be strong support for, mm -hmm. that yeah. may have weakened. Will that exist on mental health? It's hard to say, so we don't ask about that. But I think it does really, um, it really points to one of the really difficult things about the welfare state generally, is a lot of our conception of it is about the welfare state as a short-term intervention, as opposed to a long-term uh, supportable income and that's where the disability piece becomes really tricky right those many many of those people will not be able to sustain work or will not be able to sustain work that keeps them out of poverty but our mental model and the public mental model is about kind of short-term interventions mm -hmm. to get you back into work or get you back on your feet disability yeah well it's quite when well, there's just a tension in there isn't there because you know the how do I put this? I mean, the mental health lobby believes that people should be getting into work because it's good for them. I mean, you, as long as you haven't got a horrible job, but you know, if you a good job, it's good for your mental health, clearly. Um, and I think the public, uh, I mean, I, I remember a quote years ago from a former permanent secretary about the sort of change in the 60s and 70s when the disability benefits started rising, who said rather brutally, well, you, you know, when it was, when it went to qualify a disability benefit, you had to be missing a leg. He said there wasn't much argument about that, was there? But when it comes to that stress and anxiety, it all gets a lot more difficult um, because you, the system worries about people taking it for a ride because it's quite hard to measure mm -hmm. and the public worries about that too because mm -hmm. it's quite judgmental about these things. Uh, and then you want to get people into work because it's good for them to get into work and it uses the benefit expenditure better. So there's quite a lot of tensions in here. And I suspect public attitudes, I mean, I don't know, but I suspect public attitudes will sort of fluctuate around that, partly depending on how it's presented. So is that pe that's pessimism, I think. Slightly. You used the word tension, but really you're a pessimist. <laughs> right, Laura, what do you um, think? So the only kind of cash spending in the Conservative manifesto was on easing of personal independence, payments, reassessments, and carers' leave. So that is... A recognition that to the extent they are thinking about it, they're thinking about exactly these things. And I think, you know, the the efforts to restrain disability spending via tightening up assessments has basically not worked in terms of the spending. And there is evidence, I think, in the Tory manifesto that the uh, the emphasis is shifting away from that. Um, I think the only thing I'd add on disability is we did some work in 2016 on kind of what the bigger disability employment support system looks like. So there's some like access to work, which helps people stay in work is a really good benefit, really under a really good spending line. Um, the fit for work service to try and support people to return when they were off work due to illness was a, a failed experiment. And as a result, we have a vacuum in the kind of statutory sick pay Easter assessment phase period. Um, that means, so, sorry, I'm talk I think we spend a lot of time from a benefits perspective thinking about 
how do we get these people who are out of work and have a health condition back into work? And the argument we made a few years ago was we could probably have at least as big an impact thinking about how we prevent people who develop health conditions or they get worse when they're in work um, from falling out of work when they get sick. And with kind of fit for work, having not worked and still this kind of statutory sick pay assessment phase vacuum, uh, we've got a lot of work to do there on the outflow, and mm. uh, that's what I'd love to hear more about in the next mm. parliament. Okay, great. Right, let's get some questions. Are there some, has someone got a mic? I've got a mic here. There's one in the middle here, behind you. Okay. Have we got, have we got a mic there? Let's just take a cluster over here. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Lois Lane from the National Housing Federation. Um, I thought the your idea about the uh, adjusting state pension age according to life expectancy was really interesting. Uh, but how would one deal with the fact that life expectancy and particularly healthy life expectancy varies so dramatically mm. across regions and particularly across income distributions? Um, would Are we looking at a future where your state pension age is different if you're sort of, you know, healthy middle class person in Surrey versus someone in mm. Glasgow? Yeah, right. That's, that came up with it. Hold yeah, up we're a second, we're going to get some questions. Yeah, I, I know you're keen. Yes, I'm keen. Let's take a few over here. Uh, thank you. I'm Tony Wilson from Institute for Employment Studies. Um, so I think my main question is about, picks up on some of the last points actually, about how sort of wider policy changes interact with these issues, with the sort of changes to social security entitlement. We talked about the potential separation of Job Centre Plus from social security, where I think there might be some merit, but... but Probably for, an, for another day, worth discussing for another day. Um, and, we, and, but, and you talk a bit about the WCA, but the WCA is a really good example there. Labour are saying they're going to abolish that entirely, which is remarkable. Um, and the Lib Dems are going to say, which is even, even more sort of remarkable, I think, they're going to just devolve it to local authorities, so get local authorities to do it. And thinking about how some of this interacts with then the benefits people claim, particularly think back to the 1980s and the huge growth in incapacity benefit because of that, 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 those failings in, in assessing benefits, I think that presents some real challenges. So I think overall my assessment is manifestos are quite weak on measures around activation, supporting more people to work, around measures on the supply side to encourage participation in, in work, and in particular around um, the point about income transfers to, to low-income working households and Labour's ambition to eradicate working poverty when three quarters of, of children in, in households in poverty are in working households and they've done nothing mm -hmm. and they're not proposing anything on universal credit in, in work. Um, so sorry, there's a few things in there, but the policy, I think in, interaction policy, I think is really interesting. Sorry, just to clarify, the word remarkable can be read both ways. So you're, remarkable, you mean it's a turkey? So I mean, it's you said that you said it was remarkable the proposal on the WCA, which could mean yeah. remarkably good or remarkable as in ridiculous. Oh, I, I think the Lib Dems' proposal in particular is barmy because I, oh, I, can't, I can't see how local okay. local authorities have no res responsibility for the spend ultimately, and, yeah. um, and and nobody wants to make these difficult decisions, and they are you know they are really difficult decisions. So I think yeah, yeah, it's a really stupid policy. Right. <laughs> Question next to you, um, Paul Pivan from Learning and Work Institute. Um, two two quick ones. Um, one is about how you scrap universal credit or thereabouts. Um, we were an employment unit back in 96, and at that stage we were calling for the abolition of the employment service um, because it was uh, an implementation of job seekers allowance was, was doing the kind of stuff which people are talking about now in terms of universal credit. When the new government came in, there was a, a distinct possibility that that might have happened mm -hmm. but there was what turned out was a major culture change inside the employment service moving towards job center plus so they were then trusted with develop, de okay. delivering the new deal and did so very effectively in a much more um positive okay customer th yep. the second question oh two two is about two child limit thinking about um, Thomas Cook. So you have a major firm employing lots of parents who goes bust. A lot of those parents have more than two children. Those people will be caught mm -hmm. by the two child limit immediately and that will scupper the political uh, support for that two child limit for new claimants. Okay. Right. Possibly. Okay. Right. Okay. Let's go on, Nick. I know you're really keen. So, life expectancy. Oh, life expectancy. Yeah, yes. Yes. Um, I mean, there reviews. is. You know, clearly there is a problem in differential life expectancy by social class and background and all that. 
quite how you address it, I don't know. I mean, if you know, at what point do you do the assessment of to decide whether you're going to your retirement age is going to be, and you're going to have, have a test for it. And I suspect the test for it will make the work capability assessment look like a walk in the park in terms of controversy as to... Yeah, right, because you know. you're, you're then dealing with the question not of are you fit for work, but are you fit for the work for which you're qualified, right? Mm. Which is the kind of unspoken problem behind a lot of the disability benefit regime. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's not like... It's always good to put yourself... Because there have been reports written over the years making exactly this point, yep. saying, in theory, would it be better to have a retirement age based on your longevity? And every attempt to put ourselves in the shoes of policymakers, because think tanks can write all kinds of nonsense, the, um, who have tried to actually look at doing it, mm. it is really hard. So what's the, so then it's worth, where do you actually go as a policymaking, worrying about that situation? Where, where are we actually going? Which is basically people are put on disability benefits for the last few years before they head into their pension. And you are, through that system, trying to pick up the people that should be, who have got that problem, but you can't make a pension system fit for purpose to do with that. Is that perfect? No. But someone, the next report for someone writes on the need to have variable pension age needs to actually have a proposal for do it that somebody could actually do, because it is really, really hard. Right. The, um, now, uh, Tony's um, has gone to balmy rather than remarkable. <laughs> oh, I was just going to pick up the kind of activation um, employment service points mm -hmm. made by both Tony and Paul. Uh, I suppose three quick things to say. Um, I agree. Like, I agree that I think there's too little conversation about where we're going on that side. All parties are, are weak on that and failing to recognise the long-term success story that Britain's active labour market policy has been. Uh, there were phases with kind of uh, maybe where that was balanced between conditionality, um, financial support and um, practical support. So kind of long term employment success for single parents is a really good example where maternity rights, New Deal for lone parents and lone parent obligations all married together. And then maybe in recent phases, uh, it's gone too far on the kind of sanctioning first approach to that. But the big picture is it's contributed to our record high employment rate. It's been a really big success story. It marks us out really clearly from places like the US and we shouldn't lose that. I'd add to it, as I said, the need to focus on progression. So we've previously done some work on what a high employment, low impression, sorry, low progression uh, labour market looks like and how active labour market policies should respond that in particular helping young people stuck in low paid jobs for long periods to move upskill, uh, take the risk on trying out a new job opportunity. Um, and just a, a final quick point, uh, right in the weeds of the report in box two, uh, we talk about uh, how the job centre would function in an upcoming downturn, in the next downturn. So the number of advisors has fallen by a third over the past eight years or so. And while unemployment's at record low, changes in UC and ESA means we're actually expanding the group of claimants that have some conditionality applied to them. And we're asking the job centre to assess all housing benefit payments. So do a massive load of new stuff that local authorities used to do. Um, so on, when you take all that into account, the kind of advisor to claimant ratio has actually been rising for a few years. If we have a downturn, I think we'd be looking at kind of stop managed migration, stop all in work conditionality, uh, let all housing payments fly through kind of day one in order to deal with those unemployment caseloads given the reduction in job centre capacity. Um, so it's those kind of operational things as well as the kind of wider activation focus that you're right are very lacking in the current debates and I'd like to hear more about. And Paul said maybe people will change their mind on the two child limit when people in work are suddenly affected. And move out. What do you reckon? Uh, maybe. I mean, I do, again, not, not to rubbish public attitudes but it's not it's, it's not quite as mechanistic as that right it's to do with how things sound and how they feel and concepts of personal responsibility and whether or not a sort of single big offflow would make a dent in that i'm not i'm not sure right just to be slightly blunt to it so who is affected by the two child limit okay L large ethnic minority families hugely disproportionate mm -hmm. okay so that is, and no one ever says that. The case made for the policy is all about fairness between middle class families and poor families. One of the reasons why uh, it is popular is because lots of white people don't mind benefits being taken off large Ethiopian and Somali and Bengali families in. Well, I don't, I, no, I'm going to challenge you on that. Yeah. I wouldn't okay, think the general on. public know that. I know that. You know yeah. that. 
you might know it if you live where I live in Newham, yeah, right? Okay. But if you live where I come from and some of your family come from in Grimsby, you might not know that, right? So I'm, I, I wouldn't bet that that attitude well, is yeah, racialised. Lots of white families aren't going to be affected. Well, but I mean, that's, that presupposes anyway. the public knows how the benefit system works, right? <laughs> Which, We're not knowing, but who's actually affected by it? Literally, yeah, the people, but, there, aren't, there are less families with more than two kids. There aren't many of them, basically. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, right, this conversation's gone down. Right, uh, <laughs> it's totally my fault. Oh, okay, right, let's get three more questions. There's a lady at the front. There's a, there's a mic. I'd like to raise an antenna. You've got a mic? Right. I'm Robinson. I'm a non exec uh, director with uh, Ofgem, the energy regulator. What's actually interesting me is what's ha going to happen in terms of reducing people's costs. Yep. And I think energy is quite a good example because we've, we know that the uh, the, 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 the ceiling on, on energy is going to remain anyway. And not only that, but for instance, I think it's the Labour Party have suggested that they're going to push 2.8 billion into energy, which is obviously to reduce demand. And that helps the money go further. And I think there are a number of things like that that are well worth looking at because yeah. that will have an, an impact on what people actually basically need to Great manage. Question. Yep. Let's get two more. There's a lady in the middle there. Go on Hi, um, thank you. Uh, Kaylee from Citizens Advice here. Um, in Laura's presentation, there was a really interesting graph around security and progression. A lot of the conversation that we've been having has been about the value of benefits. Um, and often, security comes down as much to design as it does to value how much support we're financially giving people. It's a huge factor when we look at our citizens' advice evidence here. Um, what kind of hope do the panel have that we can get into a design conversation with whichever next government we have, uh, not just a value one? Can tell us a bit more about what kind of issues you're... Oh, so the big factor here is around monthly assessments within universal credit um, and rigidity of it. So the date being fixed to when you make your claim quite specifically. Okay, that's another great question. Let's get one more and then we'll end from over here. Let's jump in the middle. Hey, uh, Reese Cockrell from DWP. Um, you both, well, quite a few, you've mentioned kind of housing in terms of the issues and some of the challenges, but not much in terms of the solutions. I wonder if that was because you thought it's a lower priority than some of the child poverty stuff, or you think Actually, the debate's mis moved to kind of supply bricks and mortar versus kind of personal subsidies. Okay, brilliant question. Right, uh, Laura, why don't we kick off on Anne's question from Ofgem, which is one of the one of the big things that's different in this election campaign to like the last twenty years is parties promising. The childcare thing has been building over time, but there's lots of in-kind support, which yes. is pretty universal, which is largely focused on cost reductions. But yeah, I think I think that's a really good point, and that's why, although we didn't, you can sort of decide where you draw the line and what you include we attempt to include the impacts of lots of the non-direct cash transfer based benefits the only the only, so i think it is really important our report documents in more detail how as well as a move towards focused on cost-based benefits <coughs> like the cost of your disability or the cost of your housing there's been a move in focus towards in-kind support free school meals um yeah childcare and the sort of expansion of that to things like broadband in this election continues that journey. The only point I would make, which was shown up on my distributional charts, although I didn't focus on it for Labour and the Lib Dems, is if your goal is, boost, is boosting incomes or reducing costs for <coughs> those at the lower end of the income distribution, the poorest, these kind of policies are very expensive ways of doing that because they are generally pretty flat across the income distribution. So that's not to say they're a bad thing. There are really good reasons for doing that. But you spend you, you spend money on everyone to do that, which is fine. But that's not as targeted as means the kind of means tested benefit system we have. And then I just mm -hmm. respond to Kaylee really quickly. Um, yeah, I think those are, are great questions. I think obviously with the kind of the scrap you see promise and I think Labour have said they'd end move to fortnightly assessments and reduce the five week wait. There's it seems like there's the most policy space there in what's been said in the manifestos in terms of addressing some of the issues you raise. But actually, I think the mood music is shifting in general on some of these things. And there are people are starting to talk about things like backdating your UC claim to the date after your last paycheck. 
Uh, I don't think, I think that's something any of the parties could get on board with after the election. And there's other kind of creative suggestions out there too. Within this kind of, we say Labour, you know, Labour are going further, but there is this kind of, I think, acceptance that parties want to keep tweaking these kind of bits of UC in order to make it fit with the complexity of really vulnerable people's lives, which far too little thought was has been given to at phases in the UC development process. It's all about making lines on charts look more less kinky than they did under tax credits for, for too long. Um, so obviously Labour said the most on it, but I think there is quite a bit of policy space to make some of these changes and that wouldn't necessarily pull the rug out from under UC. And also, sorry, the Lib, the Lib Dems on... Um, the assessment period for self-employed people in the minimum income floor is another good example of something they have said that would ease some of those concerns. So yes, I think we can, I think we'll go in that direction, whatever happens. Nick, how? Yeah, no, I'm sure there will be tweaks, but some, some of it's actually quite difficult. You know, the monthly assessment, I mean, you know, the truth is that fortnightly payment has been available from the very beginning. It's just that DDW didn't tell anybody about it because it's mm -hmm. administratively complicated. Loans were available, advances were available from the very beginning. They just didn't tell anybody because they didn't have the machinery to deliver it. These are now there. And the, the, you know, given that increasingly UC will apply to people in work who are being paid monthly, the monthly assessment period actually makes quite a lot of sense. It's the fr payment frequency that is the issue, the bigger issue, I think. Because if you, if you, I mean, you could... It just strikes me quite difficult. Somebody walks in to make a claim. Um, and if you have a fortnightly assessment, well, technically, I could claim. I've not been paid in the past fortnight. I get paid monthly. You know? um, so you need to find somewhere option, instantly option, differenti option. differentiating how people have been paid beforehand, honestly and accurately. So it's not, it's not totally easy. You know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, housing. Why, don't, why aren't we banging on about spending more on housing benefit, or why, we, why, do, why do we just care about children? Is it just well, I mean, there's, like, the, 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 there's quite a lot of house building in some of the manifestos, isn't there? And, the, the, and that's kind of, you know, social security system does tend to get blamed for things that are going badly wrong elsewhere in society, and it all sort of lands on the social security system, and people say, well, it's not working very well, and it's all its fault. Uh, when actually, you know, housing benefit, the problem with housing benefit is house building. I mean, the, the, the whole problem about that. And, you know, some of the things that, that ministers think will work don't, because I remember when they cut the housing allowance to 30%, they said, well, you know, housing benefit is now such a large part of landlords' income that this will actually affect the market and rents will go down. And rents didn't go down, yeah. and the bill went back up. You know, I mean, it's just... Yeah. What's our conclusion from that, though? Well, the conclusion is you have to... You, you, the conclusion is there's a very slow, long-term answer to that, which is let's have some more housing and some more social rented housing. Yeah, yeah. so it's social rented but, housing. But, it's not house building, right, that's going to do it. And I think that the, the, the yeah, big picture to kind of borrow your long your kind of long time scale is the residualization of social housing, right? It's the decision that social yeah. housing was for high needs people, not for low income working families mm -hmm. and everything that flows from that. And if you look at the projections around particularly people aging in the private rented sector, we should be really, really worried about that because it means people on very low incomes in insecure housing that will affect their health, will make them more disabled, that are ill as they approach retirement and that are iller after it. Mm -hmm. Now, I just think we should just, on your question, Anne, yeah. which is we didn't, what we haven't touched on here and we don't cover in this report, but it's a big deal and across actually all the manifestos is, if I compare it to like manifestos over the last decade, yeah. climate change is just a much bigger part of them. Yeah. Yeah. And the scale of the proposals on energy efficiency spend, yeah. Yeah. which in most cases, I think in all three parties is means tested spend. So it's kind of grants for, for retrofitting of yeah. low income families' houses to bring down their energy bills. That is a, that's just like a big change. Yeah. And obviously we're about to find, and most experiences of trying to give people loans to do that to their houses have been catastrophic failures. Not just, not just the coalition government, but that one was particularly a uh, big failure. So that is a, that is a change, to, and we'll now find out whether this, how quickly the investment actually happens, like whether it actually gets people's energy bills down, whether they think their energy bills are down, all that. Yeah. That's a really interesting question that we're going to... Well, well, and the, the other thing is, I mean, things like warm home discounts, which mm -hmm. goes to everybody over a yeah. certain age, whether they need it or not, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, things like that I think really need to be looked at so we can make sure that the most money 
If I can just say on the point about costs, which I think is really well made, obviously we've talked about housing, something that doesn't tend to get talked about, but it's a massive portion of low income families spends, it's transport. And particularly if you look at people living outside of large cities, um, in rural areas, often very low income people can be reliant on taxis, the proportion of their supposedly disposable income that goes on just getting around is just unbelievably high and I think that's an area of cost particularly if we want to continue that labour market activation story that really needs looking at. Now um, uh, it's all about keeping your promises in election periods and I have failed you by five minutes on finishing time <laughs> it's a disgrace so first of all apologies but secondly can we thank the panel for their contributions today. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Like all good trilogies, there is a sequel. Uh, on Thursday, we'll be discussing all of the manifestos now that will be published and with a slightly bigger picture take on where does that leave us, what's going on. So you definitely want to sign up to that. It's going to be like The Last Jedi, not like the prequels which are rubbish of <laughs> Star Wars. Just to reassure you. Have a good day, everyone. That's all very good. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, it was so late.